See you later, uh, Weekly Darts Cast. If you don't watch that podcast, guys, go watch it. Very good podcast. Probably the best one out there at the moment. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of the Weekly Darts Cast. I'm Alex Moss, and alongside me, delighted to welcome Darts Statistician and the newly crowned local legend of Compass Sprint, Burton DeWitt. Congratulations on the new title. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well, Alex. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. We're coming off a, a rare weekend when my two teams, Colchester and Stowe Market, have both won. So, touch with that's going to carry on for a few more weeks. Enough about that, though. We've got lots to pack into the show. We've got four guests lined up for you this week. You're going to hear from two Davies Hunts in the Grand Slam this weekend Nathan Rafferty, Mike Tedecker, a young man who took the world of the darts by storm at the weekend, Fabian Schmutzler, and also the Sky Sports presenter Emma Payton all joining us on the programme. We'll start off by looking ahead to the Grand Slam gets underway this weekend in Wolverhampton and it's going to be the first PDC only Grand Slam that we've ever seen. What are the storylines that you're most looking forward to seeing unfold over the next nine days? Well, I think how you introduce the question is one of those storylines and it's how this tournament's going to evolve and be without having any BDO representation and having, in fact, only PDC representation. And we did, to some extent, see it last year, even though there were BDO players that were just the two of them last year. The men's world champion, Wayne Warren, and the women's world champion, Makura Suzuki. The other 30 players all came from the PDC, but there was a bunch of other storylines that dominated last year's event, namely going behind closed doors, not being in Wolverhampton for the first time, expanded uh, field of qualifiers from uh, Pro Tour and other events just based on the fact that it was a weird calendar due to COVID. But this year, we really get to see what this event can be without having players from outside the PDC umbrella. Who are they replaced with? Well, they're replaced with people on not some of the global tours that the PDC has, but some of the PDC secondary tours, though, that are held at a global level, per se. So you have the winners of the challenge tours. You have the winners of the development tours. You have the world youth finalists. And of course, you have, well, you have the winner of the first set of six uh, super series of, or uh, sorry, women's series events. Fallon Shark won both sets. You have Lisa Ashton who finished second in the second set. So we get a different type of diversity. Instead of having BDO, we have players who are on the secondary tours for the PDC and how they compete, how they are able to contend is going to be an interesting storyline and how that compares to how the BDO representation did for, well, better part of a decade and a half. I'm looking forward to see. Beyond that, There's not many storylines that really grip me per se yet. We'll see what happens once it gets going. We do have the top eight players who all qualified by right. We have 10 of the top 11 in the world, only Nathan Aspinall missing out. So just at the top end of the game, I should also say 13 of the top 15 qualified for that. So just at the top of the game, this is one of the most stacked fields we've ever had. But the players who are coming in either through qualifying or through the replacement events for replacement places for the BDO have every chance to beat them on their day. Rusty Jake Rodriguez, we've talked about him a few times this year. He's been fantastic. Jim Williams just topped the challenge toward our merit. Matt Campbell topped the other challenge toward our merit. Roby John Rodriguez qualified through the uh, Euro Challenge Tour, but all sorry, he qualified um, not through the Euro Challenge Tour. He qualified by making the uh, World Cup final, but. He's had one hell of a season, even though he doesn't have a tour card, qualified easily for the world championships because of how well he did on the pro tour. So there's a lot of those players who will be challenging those top eight, top 15 players in the world and have every chance to beat them. And how they stack up is the other storyline I'm looking to see this upcoming week in Wolverhampton. It's going to be an interesting week, and I'm going to save talking about the draw for the, the next question because you've got to be excited after some of the groups that have been pulled out of the hat by Barry Hearn for what we're going to see in the, the first four or five days of the event. But I'll start off with the players that we knew were in the Grand Slam before last Friday's tour card holder qualifier. So almost three quarters of the field and already we had a, a lot of quality names in there. And as you say, some of these spots have been taken up by players from the affiliated tours that are put on by the PDC and some interesting names in there. You've got to mention the, the two ladies that have come through the, the women's series, Fallon Cherick, Lisa Ashton, both in there. The other players that we're seeing coming through, Matt Campbell, who is going to be back on the stage and he's got his tour card for next year already. So these are players that a lot of them have got tour cards for next year. Jim Williams uh, and Rusty Jake Rodriguez. Really, this is a, a free hit for them. They're going to be going up there with lots of confidence from what they've done on those tours and not having to worry about defending money or trying to make money to move up the rankings to, to save tour cards, which is what some of the, the people in the field are, are going to be having to think about this weekend. So 
looking forward to seeing how all those guys get, get on. And I guess we have to talk about the tour card holder qualifier on Friday and uh, a certain Raymond Van Barneveld getting through the qualifier because you go back to the, the end of last year and we, we knew he was making a comeback. He was going to be going to Q School to try and win back the tour card. And a lot of our show at the start of the year, the first two or three months, a lot of talk among Darts fans was how is Barney going to get on in his comeback? Is he going to be able to get through Q School? And then when he does get his tour card, what's he going to do? He goes and wins a, a title on the floor, wins a Players' Championship event. After that, he had a, a few health scares, as we know. There was a couple of events that he had to pull out of. Then he had a 115 average in July, made a, a quarterfinal. Since then, though, he's not got past the last 32, and we were getting towards the end of the year, and we were thinking, well, we are going to see him at Ali Pali. But Barney's name's not really been mentioned that much over the last few months. So to see him get through the qualifier, all of a sudden, we're thinking, oh, yeah, Barney's back on the tour, isn't he? And we are going to see him on TV. He's going to be back on Sky for the first time since that game against Darren Young, the game that was his retirement game before he came back at the start of this year. So that's going to be a storyline to follow is how will Barney get on in his return to a big event on Sky. And there's some of the other names as well. I mean, you mentioned a few of them, but John Henderson being back in the Grand Slam for the first time since 2011. So 10 years since we've seen him involved in that. And the, the short race that the group stage is, first to five legs, it does make it a live event for for a lot of these players. They have got a shot at causing an upset over the, the best of nine format. So yeah, we'll come on to the draw now, but it's shaping up to be a, an exciting week. Now, this is arguably one of the best group stage draws ever for the Grand Slam. Can you pick out a group of death from the eight groups or you think there might be several to choose from? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure looking at the draw, there's too many groups where you'd say that if you had all four players finishing in, in any order, I wouldn't be surprised. But I certainly think for most of the groups, you're looking at three out of the four players. It is hard to pick two of those three confidently that are going to finish in the top two and that does go to show the strength of depth that we now have in the PDC players that are coming through and players from the, the affiliated tours that they are real contenders to to do some damage in these events but I'm probably going to lean towards group F as, as my group that's going to be the, the group of death and that group does include the defending champion Jose de Souza. he set himself high standards hasn't he the last year or so and he's only had one quarter final in the last eight events two in the last 12 since that that semi-final on the Euro Tour Looks like he's coming back into some form after the the last Super Series. He had some decent averages in there, and I know he's spoken about he's had a few health problems recently, but 11 of his 12 averages in the the Super Series last week were 95-plus, and that is the consistency that we've we've come to expect from Jose de Souza. So he'll want to put a a good account of himself in his Grand Slam debut. This will be the the first time that he's played at Wolverhampton. He made his debut last year and went all the way, of course, but he's in in a very tough group. Luke Humphreys, who's made... Four finals this year. Mensa Sulevich, who we've only seen come back onto the tour the last few months, but he's made a final and he's played some good stuff again. And I mentioned him in the in the last one, but Matt Campbell as well, who's got a, a free hit really this weekend. Confidence-wise, he'll be going into it with a lot and he'll fancy his chances that short race. We've seen what he's done in the World Cup, being some top players, that he could uh, have a, a good run in Wolverhampton. Aside from that, there's, there's a couple of groups that I might put in the mix as well. Confidence-wise, I think Group B is hard to pick a group where you've got four players together that have got more confidence right now. Johnny Clayton just keeps winning TV titles this year. Mervyn King, that monster average that he just had in the World Series. Bradley Brooks just won the UK Development Tour, and he's got a a tour card next year regardless of where he finishes in the rankings. And and Rusty Jake Rodriguez, who has just won five titles on the the European Development Tour, and he's got his tour card for the next two years. So that is an interesting group, and... The last one I mentioned, Groupie, I wouldn't call it a, a group of death, but given the, the form that Peter Wright's been in over the last month or so, he is going to be a little bit anxious going into it, isn't he? Because there are some players that could quite easily trip him up in that group stage. Gabriel Clements, who beat him in the World Championship last year. Fallon Sherrick, who's always a, a danger on the stage. He brings a, a best start to the stage. And Mike Zidekka, who really turned it on in that Grand Slam qualifier last week and will be going into it, fancying his chances of continuing the the good run that he started last week yeah and i think you summed it up perfectly there's so many groups where you look at it and there's three out of the four players who you'd really say on current form and overall ability and talent you wouldn't be surprised if they finished first second or third granted probably in some of those groups the person who we left out is going to end up winning that group somehow but that starts these days (laughs) but yeah I, i don't see there being a group of death for that reason because there's not a group that has all four players that you would say on paper 
have every chance and any chance to win the group and to go far in this tournament. But there's no group that is, on the other hand, that is a group of life. Um, maybe the one you mentioned with Peter Wright being the closest because of Peter Wright's current form and because we don't know what to expect from Mike Decker. He was great in the Grand Slam qualifier. He was great against one of the form players in Kim Hybrex in that final as well. Uh, it looked like it was Kim Hybrex to lose before it started and Mike Decker just pummeled him from the beginning so he got into here but peter wright and mike decker well peter wright struggling mike decker you wouldn't expect to play to that standard again at least over three matches fallon sherrick might be might be the most informed player in here but gabriel clemens has really come on as of late that's the closest to a group of life though and it's even still a pretty darn difficult group and probably the only group that really could see it going in any order among the four as a result yeah, I, I just I, I there isn't a group of death, in my opinion, the closest if there is a group of death is group A. And that's because you have the world number one who hasn't looked like the world number one the last few months, but he's looked like the world number three. Maybe that's not a bad place to be. Christoph Ratajski just won the last event at the last Super Series and has been playing really, really well in televised events pretty much nailed on to make the semifinals of everything uh, before losing in the semifinals. Martin Schindler has been a revelation this year after his career had backtracked over the last few years, won back his tour card and was just, well, literally from the start of the year, because was, as the season started, he won the German Super League. And in the end, he didn't need to because he would have finished as the number three Pro Tour qualifier because he wasn't that good this year, winning almost 30,000 pounds in uh, players' championship events and on the Euro Tour. Nathan Rafferty rounding out the... Uh, Group be the only Irish qualifier here, as surprising as that sounds right now. That's, I think, the closest to a group of death because you really have three players playing at a really high standard currently, and Nathan Rafferty isn't any slouch himself. But I don't think there is a group of death per se. It's just eight really good groups, and it should lead to a really good tournament. You mentioned Nathan Rafferty. Let's hear from him now. Here's our chat with player that's making his long-awaited TV debut this weekend in the Grand Slam. Here's our chat with Nathan Rafferty. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by one of the debutantes in this year's Grand Slam of Darts, Nathan Rafferty. Thanks for the time, Nathan. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having Really looking forward to next week, anyway. Well, we're talking exactly one week before you make your TV debut in the Grand Slam. How are you feeling right now, a week away from the event? Nervous? Excited? A bit of both? Yeah, I'm nervous, but I'm excited. I've got a tough group on I'm really looking forward to playing against the best players in the world on TV. Like, so they're there to be beat, aren't they? <laughs> well, you've got a spot in the Grand Slam via the development tour, finishing second as Bradley Brooks had already qualified last weekend. What's the last week been like building up to the Grand Slam and the draw yesterday? Oh, it was bad. I, was, I, I actually didn't even have a clue about getting into the Grand Slam. Um, I was watching the final when Brad was in because I knew he's overtaking me. But and the uh, order emerged, so. I was feeling down after that, but as soon as, soon as I um, went over to gra- congratulate him, he said, you know you got a Grand Slam player, so I didn't even have a clue about it. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days. Well, obviously everyone wants to get to Ali Pali, the World Championship. That is the, the biggest event. But if you had a, a second choice, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be the Grand Slam because you've got a guaranteed free games on TV. Yeah, well, it was the best out of a bad situation. That's why I love it. I still have a chance in the world if I win the World Youth end of the month so still a chance anyway well let's go back to the start for you and Dart you're still only 21 years old but you've been around the PDC setup for the last five years where did it start for you and Darts? how did you get introduced to the sport Um, I got a board for Christmas my dad got my board for Christmas about 10 years ago so I was got my accountant from school so I was and just I practiced nearly every day for a few years and got really good at it at that point being from Northern Ireland, how much did you look up to the likes of Brendan Dolan, Mickey Mansell, Daryl Gurney growing up? How much of an inspiration were they as well? Oh, uh, they're massive. Like, um, always growing up, watching them boys, always thinking I'd love to be where they're at in their careers, 100%. Mickey only lives less than a mile away from me, so me and him get a good catch-up from time to time. Good to hear. Well, before we saw you start to play on the development tour in 2016, talk us through your darts up to that point. Were you playing a lot at home or, or locally in Northern Ireland? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was winning a lot of tournaments back home, like from 15 to 16. I was winning a very good amount. Got a big breakthrough one time, beating Doral in the final of the big tournament in Tipperary. And after that, uh, Matt signed me. 
I was talking to them and ever since I just started going over to England and playing getting better and better every year Just after you turned 17 we saw you went to Q School for the first time in 2017 what was that experience like playing in Q School for the first time? I was nervous like I didn't really know what to expect like it was tough like really tough I didn't have a really good time at it but it was something that I really learned from and from the Challenger playing Challenger it's like playing Q School now so it was so Overlearn. Well, you came very close to winning a, a tour card the following year. In 2018, you made some big strides that year as well. I've got to mention the UK Open that year. You get through the first session on the Friday. Your name is drawn out with Peter Wright, who was the defending champion at the time. What was your reaction when you saw the draw? Oh, I was buzzing. Uh, I was like, well, playing one of the best players in the world. Give it a good game and see what you can do. I knew I could beat him. Like, I know I have the darts to beat him, but... I wasn't really expecting to beat him, but it happened, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember following that game on Dark Connect, as surprisingly the game wasn't picked for the main stage. How surprised were you when you saw that you'd be playing Peter on, I think it was board five? Yeah, I was actually very surprised. I thought, well, you're playing the defending champion, he's bound to be on TV, like you said, you're going to get a bit of exposure a wee bit, but no, I never happened, even after I beat him. I didn't even get in the TV after. I was surprised. <laughs> well, it was, it was our loss because watching it on Dark Connect, it looked like a, a great game. You had a, I think it was a one three six or one oh one check out. You had a, a brilliant leg to break for nine all. Then you hold throw to win it ten nine. What are your memories of that night in Minehead? I just remember everyone coming to watch that game. And that was like the setter. Just how how Minerva and Peter. I don't think he was at his best to be fair. Like, but it's not my fault for that. But I was just enjoying the experience and just got over it, didn't I? And not long after that, you go and pick up your first PDC title on the development tour. What did that mean to you to be a, a winner on the PDC circuit? Oh, not the ring. There's just a bit of form, signing with Target after that, and then going on in April to win my first development tour. Was just, everything was just happening at the right time for me. It was tough to be a winner over in England, like it's not easy. Well, we mentioned the win over Peter Wright 2019. We see you on the, the Pro Tour quite often as one of the invited players and you pick up some more scalps. You beat Raymond Van Barneveld that year. How did you find those first experiences of playing on the Pro Tour? I felt real comfortable. I felt like I, I was meant to be there, to be fair. I still do think I'm meant to be there at some point, but I just seemed to raise my game against the top players. I don't know how, but beating Bonnie was definitely something I never really thought I'd ever do, like growing up watching them. You wouldn't really think of that, like, what happened, then. <laughs> well, let's get on to this year. We've seen a, a lot of you in the last few months. The UK Challenge Tour, you won a, a title on the last weekend to put yourself right in the hunt going into the final day. It didn't go your way, unfortunately. Can you put your finger on what went wrong that day? Uh, I, I don't know. I just kind of bottled it a wee bit. <laughs> but I wasn't really playing well that last time. I played well the whole weekend, and then come that last time, I was just... I don't know, maybe just thought about it too much than I should have, but it happens, it's definitely a learning curve from that there, like. Definitely, well then, just last weekend, we had the last weekend of the UK development tour, and I've got to mention the, the one sixteen finish that you had in the decider to beat Ted Everts in the final of the penultimate event, it put you top going into that last event, was that the longest half an hour of your life between events waiting to play with all that was on the line going into that last event? Yeah, it was mad, it was, it was like such a high from doing that to getting back to reality like it was nowhere near done because to be honest like I always thought there's about seven or eight of us who's going to be near down to that last eight quarter final last 16 and it's just who does it there and then and just unfortunately I got beat last 16 like with Brad went on to win it like so fair play to him he's, he's quality like and he deserves it and you said earlier that you stuck around to, to watch the, the rest of the event unfold. Was it hard to, to watch the, the games or did you think about maybe starting to head home early and wait to hear the outcome or did you want to watch and, and find out for yourself? I was sitting watching the final and I didn't even have a clue about the grand slam, as I was saying. I was watching it and I was just like, I was, I was flat, I felt flat, like, but there they had Brad's a mate of mine, so I was there to give him a bit of support for playing. He's done my job, like. As and as we said, all all is not lost. You are going to be in the, the Grand Slam next week. You've still got the chance of, of getting to Ali Pali via the, 
the World Youth and potentially you could have a, a tour card in, in a few months' time if Bradley gets in the, the top 64 at the end of the season. Are you going to be his biggest fan when he plays at Ali Pali? I think it'll be, it'll be nervous for me next week and then it'll be nervous for him next week. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he does it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't really want to go to key school to be fair. It's tough school, as I say. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed for that. Well, away from the board, we, we should mention you touched on it as well. You're part of Matt Ward's stable of players at MDA. I was watching your Day in the Life video from a few years ago when you played Barney in an exhibition. How much of a help has Matt been in your career so far? Oh, massive. If it wasn't for Matt, I would never be over in England because... I know say it wouldn't work for me, but he, he looks after me, makes sure everything's all right, he brings me, I'm okay, everything's good, like, Matt's been a massive help to me, and I couldn't thank him more, to be fair, he's a good manager, like. Well, Wikipedia has your walk on song down as One Vision by Queen, a song which came out 15 years before you were born, do you prefer the older music, or are Queen just one of your favourite bands? I like the older music, or I like the new music too, but I don't mind. As long as the darts go, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, lastly, back to the Grand Slam. As we know, the, the draw's out. You're in Group A with Gerwin Price, Christoph Ratajski, Martin Schindler. It's a, a tough-looking group. The world number one, Ratajski's just won another title, and Martin Schindler's had a, a very impressive year on the Pro Tour. How much are you relishing the chance to play those three on stage? I'm looking forward to it. You know, they're there to beat me. Like, I'm there to beat them. But then they, you know, I can string five legs like they can at the same time. So just what way I get on on the stage. I think I'll do all right, to be fair. Um, yeah, Martin Schiller is playing very well at the moment, too. And Ritowski, on the current price, like world champion. It's not every day you get to say you play these plays on the TV. Like, so the pressure's on them more than it's on me, I think. Well, it's going to be a, a big opportunity. We're looking forward to seeing how you get on, on your, your TV debut next week in the Grand Slam. Thanks very much for your time, Nathan, and we wish you all the best in Wolverhampton next week. Cheers, buddy. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again to Nathan for joining us. Now, one more question on the Grand Slam. The qualification criteria brings with it plenty of discussion, and in particular, the eight spots for the tour card holder qualifier. Is eight still the right amount? I've always thought it was a little too much, but at the same time, it does make it more fair for the rest of the uh, tour card holders to have those spots to play for. This year, if you look at who missed out, well, we had an abbreviated Euro Tour season. So no one, the only Euro Tour winner was Gurren Price, and he was already in because he's only the world champion right now. So he was guaranteed to get in anyway. So we got to get in through the players' championships, which we don't most years when we have at least when we have a full calendar but we had michael smith and joe collin who both won multiple events but that left out callan ritz and chris dopey who also both won multiple events so they had two titles this year but based on the fact that they were lower ranked in the overall order of merit than uh, Smith and Cullen. Uh, they're the two left out, and they might feel a little hard done here because of the fact that they were able to win two titles this year. Both of them played at a very good level this year and probably deserve to be here, but they didn't get through the qualifier. If you were to say that those two deserve to go and cut back to six, I don't think anyone would say you would be wrong about that. But at the same time, eight does make up a quarter of the field and it gives at the start of the year, you know, even if you don't make a TV final, which is pretty darn difficult to do. I mean, Nathan Aspinall's pretty good player is number nine in the world. He didn't make a TV final this year. So even if you don't make a TV final, you still have or win a Euro Tour event in most years, you still have spots to play for. And that is a good thing. But maybe there should be a different qualification system than a one off qualifier. That does seem a little bit too much. Maybe there could be some sort of qualification order of merit from certain players championship events. Or if we continue with the Super Series events like it was last year, have it so that it goes to the best non-qualified player from each set of Super Series events. Or even if it's not Super Series, each set of four players championship events to at least get some of those spots and then maybe have a couple qualifiers. I think there's other things they can do to create a qualification system for players instead of one-off qualifiers. But there needs to be something that opens it up to everyone who has a tour card to get in. Because, okay, yes, anyone can make a TV final, but that's just not going to happen. And you're going to have some very, very good players who don't in a given year make a TV final. I think eight's a little high, but it's not that high. And as long as they get replaced by something similar, whether it be a super series qualification order of merit or something that gets those spots so that anyone has a chance going in to get in, who has a tour card at least to get in, I think it would be a good alternative.
this is one of our questions of the week that we've put out on Twitter. And at the moment, our poll is 59% of you going with yes, that eight spots is too many, 41% of you going with no. And it is a discussion that does rear its head every single year around this time, just after we have the tour card holder qualifier. And there are players that are unfortunate, will feel hard done by to miss out. And you mentioned them there, Chris Doby, Callum Ridd's two titles on the floor this year for both of them and they've missed out on the on the grand slam it, it does feel a little unfair for them when you compare two titles to a, a one-day qualifier that you win three or four games you get it wrapped up in two hours maybe even less than that and that's your spot in one of the major events in the pdc one of the major events in the calendar it, it doesn't quite stack up for me so for me i would probably cut it back a little bit and as we touched on at the start of the show, the Grand Slam is changing this year. Is without the BDO players for the first time. I'm sure there is going to be discussions among the PDC next year, early next year, probably after we've had the WDF World Championship at Lakeside and we've had the World Seniors at the Circus Tavern. I'm sure they will be thinking, well, should we maybe invite the World Seniors winner? Should we invite the WDF World Championship winner, the, the men's, the ladies? That is something that I'm sure will be discussed next year. And you're probably looking at the tour card holder qualifier spots that would be impacted because I think now that you have involved the affiliated tours, the development tour, the challenge tour, the women's series, you've invited the winners of those into the Grand Slam. It is hard to go back on it now, isn't it? Once you've done it this year and then you turn around and say, well, yeah, we did that this year, but we're not going to do that next year. It is an extra incentive for all these players to go to the development tour, go to the women's series, especially. We want to see more entries in that next year as well. And say there is going to be a spot, two spots in the Grand Slam and other TV events to try and qualify for. So I think those spots will stay. But I think we are looking at maybe the, the tour card holder qualified maybe being cut back. I think two spots would probably work a little bit better and maybe increase the number of spots that could go to players that win pro tour events would be nice. But again, on, on the other side of things, we have got players that have come through this qualifier they deserve to be there they've won that qualifier on the Friday but I think this might be the last year that we see just eight spots I think we might see that cut back next year and now we move on to our second of four interviews this week and it's with the qualifier for the Grand Slam Mike Decker. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by one of the debutantes in this year's Grand Slam of Darts Mike Decker. thanks for the time Mike how are you doing I'm good I'm good how are you Doing good, thank you. And we're, we're talking at the start of the week that you make your debut in the Grand Slam. How are you feeling ahead of playing in another PDC major for the first time later this week? Well, it's, it's, it's exciting. Um, first time for me playing uh, group stages in the PDC. So, yeah, it's, it's a new experience. Um, it's a good group, tough group. So, looking forward to it. And you're spotting Wolverhampton in the Grand Slam. It's only secured... Last Friday, you have one of eight players to come through that tour card holder qualifier after three days of players' championship events that week. How were you feeling going into the qualifier? Well, I didn't expect anything from the qualifier. So um, I was playing loose and relaxed. And, and I was playing well. Um, I've played well all the year. Only the beginning of the year was a bit, bit uh, scrappy. But after that, I started playing really well again. So I'm, I'm happy that... I could. Um, my first game in the qualifier was 106 average, and I didn't hit that high again. But, it, but the feeling was the same, so I kept playing really well. So I'm happy that uh, that everything clicked and the, the qualifier went my way. Yeah, it certainly did. I was going to say that the 106 average in your first game, then you get past two former world champions in yellow class and yeah. Adrian Lewis before facing your, your fellow Belgian Kim Hybrex who has been coming back into some form recently what was it like playing yeah, in the true. final for the Grand Slam spot? Oh, um, well I've played Kim a couple of times already in the PDC and, and the first couple of times it was more like oh, I'm playing a friend and, and now I didn't have that I could like block it off and just play my game just be there to win it you definitely did that. A 99 average, a 5-3 win against Kim secures your debut at the Grand Slam. Had you lost, it would have been, I think, three weeks before we saw you back for the TDPA qualifier for the World Championship. So how much of a boost is it for you to get to the Grand Slam? Yeah, it's it's a massive boost because um, I'm, not, I'm not qualified for the Players' Championship Finals and at the moment not qualified for the World. So at least having one major is, is a big boost. We'll come back to the Grand Slam a, a bit later, but let's go back to the start for you in darts. When did you first discover darts? What got you interested in playing the game? Uh, my stepdad got me uh, playing darts uh, 
um, he played when he was younger. He played a lot of darts, like league and stuff. And then he started his own business, so he couldn't couldn't fully play darts anymore, so he stopped with it. And then about eight years ago, he said, you know what, I'm going to start playing darts again. But because he didn't want to go alone to tournaments and stuff, I said, you know what, give me a set of darts and I'll join you so you don't have to go alone. And from there, it's, it started, really. And what was the dart scene like growing up in Belgium before you started playing in the, the PDC events? Were you playing a lot just at home or with friends, or were there a lot of leagues and events to play in? Well, we, uh, we did a Friday night league thing, and uh, we did a lot of um, tournaments in, in Holland, because Holland is only like an hour to the border. So we did a lot of tournaments there, because in Belgium, when I started, it was like not really big. Tournaments were like 40 people, 50 people max. And in Holland, you had easy tournaments, 150 people, 200 people entering. So we went to a lot of tournaments in Holland. I think I'm right in saying at 18, you won the, the Belgian national championships as, as well as the British Teenage Open. Looking at the names who have won those trophies in the past, what did winning those two titles mean to you? Well, the the Belgian championship is, is one I'm, I'm the most proud of because it's it's... Not many people can say I've been a Bel- Belgium champion before, so that was a big, big, big thing for me. I still have the trophy, and um, the British team is, 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 I think maybe the kickstart of my career. Um, my former manager Mac Elkin, after that tournament, he uh, he gave me a contract, so uh, that tournament got me into the PDC a bit. And you continue to progress after that. In 2015, you go on to win two titles on the PDC development tour not long before that I think you made three consecutive semi-finals so what was the feeling like when you yeah, beat Benito van der Pass to win your first PDC title well I was a bit lucky to win that because Benito missed some doubles um, but yeah it was it was a great feeling um, well it was um, you know how, how Dimitri did it on the youth so um, I, I was happy to, to get my name on a trophy and, and yeah it was a, a great feeling because Benito back then was like going up the rankings with the men's. He was top 32 at that time, I think, or just below top 32. So he was a big name for us. And how much did that help you then playing on the development tour before you went on to go on to play on the pro tour, playing the likes of Benito, Dimitri, players that were on the tour at that time to give you a bit of experience playing those bigger names? Good, because um, you learn to fight like when you're 2-0 down or 3-0 down. It, it it helps you because you know when you're over there you have to play your A A game otherwise you're not going to win anything and the U makes you first of all it makes you learn how to fight and second it, it still gives you the opportunity to, to feel what it is to win because you still have games that aren't the best but you still got through and you don't have that on the pro tour so it's a mix of both definitely well at the end of that year 2015 you earned your two year tour card for the main tour for your performances from the development tour how did you find that transition then of, of playing on the pro tour regularly and coming up against the world's best week in week out well the first time i had my tour card from my experience it was too soon i wasn't really ready to, to get the, the tour card i um my mindset was when i got my tour card that i was there already and you're nowhere near so i took it too light and and didn't put enough practice in and that's what made me lose my tour card again so how important were those couple of years after you lost your tour card, 2018, 2019, you were back playing on the, the Challenge Tour, the Development Tour. What did those two years help you in, in your darts career? Well, it's it certainly opened my eyes. Like It certainly made me look and say, look, this is not working. Um, so I put in a lot of practice and, and did a lot more than I did in the two years on the tour. So, yeah, it was a big boost for me. And the practice certainly paid off. Start of 2020, you go all the way on day two at Q School to win your tour card back. How much did that mean to you to win your card via Q School for the first time and come through a field of that quality? Yeah, it, it was a big, big relief because um, I've, when I won my tour card, I stayed till the last day to, to look at the other Belgians like Ronnie and uh, Jeffrey van Egdom. And um, if you see how nervous everyone is on the last day, I was so glad that I got my card straight on the, on the second day. And 2020, it turned into an unusual year with the pandemic and the year finished with you, though, making your World Championship debut at Ali Pali. What was that experience like playing in the biggest event in darts for the first time, but without the fans there as well? Well, um, it was the 
since the Worlds last year, if, if the darts started going big in Belgium, uh, one of the biggest um, TV uh, TV posts um, uh, started broadcasting darts. So it was the first time that it was on live television in Belgium with the Worlds, and it was my first Worlds. So I was all those things together. I was so nervous, and I, I just couldn't get going on stage. So I, the experience wasn't the best. Is that something though that you look back on almost a, a year now, and you do you view it as something that you can learn from when you do get back to Ali Pali? Yeah, of course, because uh, I was so focused on on further in the tournament than the first round. Um, I had a, an interview earlier today, and they asked me, "What are your expectations from the Grand Slam?" And I said, "Well, I did that with the Worlds, looking further than than the first match, and I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna look match a match a match and just." see what 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 goes on after the first game and then look on to the second and the third and just not going further than that well that brings us back to the the grand slam that the fans are back now as the the pandemic eases and you're going to get to play in front of a crowd again this weekend in the grand slam let's touch on your draw did you watch the draw live when it was being made no i was um i was i don't know where i was but i didn't i didn't see the draw um i think i was in a taxi to the airport <laughs> so what was your reaction then when you, you saw the draw? You're in with the, the world number two, Peter Wright, Gabriel Clemens, and uh, one of the most popular names in darts at the moment, Fallon Sherrick. Well, um, it's it's a tough group, but if you look at all the groups, all the groups are tough, so it doesn't really matter who you get. Um, you just have to play your A game and then look if you, you can beat your opponent. If they're better, they're better, and if, if they're not, then you win. It doesn't really matter who you get. And I know you mentioned your your mindset now is you're going to focus one game at a time, but these next few weeks, they are going to be important for a lot of players, including yourself, to get in that top yeah. 64 to keep your tour card. Is that on your mind going into this weekend, or are you going to treat the Grand Slam as a, a one-off event and try and focus game on game? Well, you're, I'm thinking about the tour card and the top 64, but when I'm on the hockey and playing darts, I'm just thinking about hitting the trebles and the doubles and the, the, the things that, that matter with darts and not not about the ranking or, or the world's or tour card so and what does the the rest of this week look like before you play your, your first game on saturday usually with the the major events the tv events you've got a little bit of, of time to prepare for them but this one is it's come since friday so not even a, a week how does the, the rest of this week look practice wise and getting yourself ready uh, well um i'm going to a tournament tonight and then just to keep in rhythm and then tomorrow i'll practice wednesday i'll practice and, and Thursday and then on Friday we're back off to England so and lastly looking further ahead the PDPA qualifier for the world championship that's going to be next for you after the Grand Slam what would it mean to you to get back to Ali Pali which would probably keep your tour card in all likelihood and, and play in front of a, a packed crowd and for the first time in front of that packed crowd at Ali Pali well yeah, it would mean the world um, first of all like you said it would probably keep me safe for my tour card and second um, I've played in Ali Pali but it's not the same without the crowd so it would be it would be nice to, to experience that fingers crossed for that when the qualifier comes around and wish you all the best for the Grand Slam this weekend thank Mike thanks very much for joining us thank you you're welcome thanks to Mike for joining us this week now let's uh, talk about the development tour uh, because the final uh, weekend or second and final weekend of the European Development Tour was this past weekend in Germany. And it was another two titles for Rusty Jake Rodriguez to go along with the three he won in the first uh, six events. As he cruises to the top spot, a two-year tour card, and as we already mentioned, a spot in the Grand Slam of Darts. Uh, do you think, though, looking ahead to next year, that'll hit the ground running on the Pro Tour? Yeah, I, I think he will. And we had both Rusty Jake Rodriguez and his, his brother Roby John Rodriguez on the show early this year, the same episode. And we know the competitiveness between the brothers, like any siblings, they, they want to get the better of them, whether it's in darts or whatever they're playing. But I was just looking the the Players' Championship averages for 2021. Of course, that's now finished. 44th was, was Roby John with 92.51. 45th was, was Rusty Jake with 92.47. So the two are very close, but... Rusty Jake is the one right now that does have that tour card for next year. His brother doesn't, but I'm sure he will be leaning on his brother for some advice, for some words of wisdom, as, as well as Mensa Sulevich as well. I know the three of those are very close, but it is going to be a, a step up for him next year. And I know he's played a lot of events this year on, on the Pro Tour. And this is another thing that, that Roby John spoke about 
on our show, he said that this year he's playing with a lot more freedom, not having that tour card. And they both came close to getting the tour card at Q School at the start of the year, just missed out by the order of merit. But they had the best of both worlds, didn't they? They got to play on the the pro tour as invited players. They got to play the the challenge tour, and they're, and they're just playing a lot more darts this year and playing with a lot more freedom, not having to worry about the rankings. But now that Rusty Jake does have that tour card. It is something that further down the line he is going to have to start to think about when he's defending money and that can change players' mindset going into events when they're not playing with as much freedom as they did in the past. But what can we say from what we've seen from Rusty Jake this year is that you would fancy him to settle in pretty well because he's done well on, on the tour this year. He's got into the, the spots for Ali Pali via the Pro Tour without having a tour card. I know there was a lot less European tour events this year than we've had usually, which is a factor, but still he has finished pretty high up on that list of the, the 32 to get into Ali Pali. So that does show you that he is pretty comfortable in that, in those settings. He had some, some good scalps on the tour this year and we are going to see a lot of him these next few months. We're going to see him in the Grand Slam, the Players' Championship Finals, the World Championship. And I think that will tell us a little bit more about how he copes with playing on the big stage because you've got three events there that we are going to see him in the biggest one of all of course the world championship at the end of the year how will he get on in those three will he take to those like he has to the the pro tour the development tour i think that will tell us a little bit more but from what we've seen this year on the development tour as well winning all those titles and more importantly what we've seen when he's played on the pro tour is that he isn't someone that's worried about playing the big names he will go up against them and and test them but when you have your tour card it is very different than when you're just playing as an invited player. So that is something that I'm sure he will be thinking about next year. Yeah, and I'll start where you started, which is how has he done this year on the tours? And you mentioned that he's 45th in players' championship averages. If you look at the players who are just like just behind him, the next one, Ryan Joyce, was the number four pro tour qualifier for the world championships this year. That's how well he was playing and how well he was at getting results at times this year. Some of the other people behind him, someone we haven't mentioned that much this year, Richie Edhouse uh, is 51st, so not that far behind him in averages, two tenths of a point. Richie Edhouse finished in the top 10 of the pro tour qualifiers for the world championships. Maybe we should be talking more about him because he had a very quietly a very good year. Okay, qualify, you know, he did qualify for the Euro championships, which also helped. He has a chance to be in the top 64 of the overall order of merit after the world championships on his first year of his tour card. And I don't think we've mentioned him at all this year, but Rossi Jake Rodriguez, at least average wise, had a higher set of averages this year than him. If you look on the challenge tour this year, he finished third on the Euro challenge tour on average behind only former BDO number one, Richard Vainstra and Lucas Venig. So he was the third highest average on that ahead of his brother by nearly a half a point this year. He's playing at a good standard on every tour. And we don't need to mention the development tour where he, other than the one player who we'll talk about in a second, was far above everyone else this year. He's shown that whatever tour he plays on, he will get results. He will up his game and he will play to the level needed to qualify for the world championship and to reach his goals. So, yeah, I think he will because he's obviously good enough and you can only expect that he'll get better as he plays more and more against the best players in the world. Uh, He qualified for the World Championships this year through fill-up spots for the Players' Championship events. He'll be in every single one next year. He'll be able to play all the Euro Tour qualifiers next year, hopefully for a full calendar. I think we're going to see a lot of him next year and a lot of really good results. And there's even the chance that, you know, if he does well at the Grand Slam, if he does well at the World Championships, he'll get his not needed to your tour card because he'll also get in the top 64. He does need results now, but that will be big as well because that means his ranking won't reset. Pro Tour ranking won't reset. So it'll give him a, that just that added boost to, well, first avoid the first round, possibly first two rounds of the UK Open, but also to maybe get to some of those TV events at the back end of the year. That will be even bigger for him. But I, even if he doesn't get that, even if he is starting back from zero, um, everything we've seen this year from him makes us makes me think that he's going to have a very big 2022 and should be back in the World Championships at the very least 12 months from now. Now we'll move on to our next guest on this week's show. It is a young man who's just qualified for his first PDC World Championship at the age of 16. Here's our chat with Fabian Schmutzler. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by one of the newest qualifiers for this year's PDC World Championship, Fabian Schmutzler. Thank you very much for the time, Fabian. How are you doing? I'm doing really good, so I hope you too, and thanks for having me. 
Well, thanks for taking the time to chat with us. As I said before we started, I can only imagine what the last 24 hours or so have been like for you since you qualified for Ali Pali. So tell us, what has the last day or so been like? Yes, so um, on Sunday, so yesterday, um, after the tournament, I was with my friends in restaurant, drinking, eating some stuff, and um, I was so happy. I've got so many messages uh, on my phone of Instagram and Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter. I can't even answer everyone, and it was uh, uh, such so much so much and i am so happy that i did this and i can't believe i've done this so it's i didn't even think about it before i started the development tour and i even can't believe right now that i got so far well we'll come back to the weekend a little bit later but let's go back to the start for you in darts how old were you when you first got introduced to darts and how did it happen was it through family friends or watching on tv Yes, um, my family on uh, on um, Christmas 2018, they uh, got me a, a board, a darts board, and I started playing. And then 2019, I was in a club. I started training every day with a trainer, and then I started playing tournaments and playing league. And so everything was going. And for the last five or so years, we've seen darts in Germany pick up a lot of interest with the PDC. They've put on a lot of European tour events in Germany, TV events as well. Has that made you more interested in darts as well? Yes, of course. Um, I'm interested in every tournament of PDC and also in others here located, located in Germany. Um, and it's really, really uh, good to see also some friends I have uh, seen in PDC, it's like a little motivation for me to see them on stage or even playing in such like Super League. Um, yes, it's uh, a motivation for me, of course. And are there any players that stick out for you in terms of inspiration? Are there players from Germany, the likes of Max Hopp and Gabriel Clemens, or some of the players right at the top, like Michael Van Gogh and Peter Wright, that you've looked up to over the last few years? Yes, of course, uh, special Max Hopp and Gabriel Clemens or Martin Schindler. They play good darts, uh, especially Martin Schindler right now and Gabriel Clemens and also Max Hopp. Maybe not right now, but we don't have uh, to criticize him. He was or is such a good darts player and he is one of the uh, ones that makes that made darts in Germany famous and yes also what a great what a number one Gervin Price or Mike van Gerven or Peter Wright what the standard is in darts right now it's just amazing to see this 110 averages every day in uh, their tournaments and it's, it's it's such a high standard and it's just fun to watch it yeah, it definitely is. And you, you mentioned there that you started playing at the end of 2018, then you started practicing a, a lot more. What was the time like during all the, the lockdowns that we've had last year and, and the start of this year? Did you spend a, a lot of time practicing at home, working on your game? Yes, uh, I played a lot, lot of uh, um, online tournaments. This uh, from Ivan in of Facebook, this COVID um, league, or also this Dutch Bordeaux and Premier League from my sponsor, which included Lucas Wenig of France Red or Ricardo Petrescu. I played also a lot other little tournaments online, and yes, I had very much. Everyone had much time, and I spent them a lot on the dartboard, and um, this was helping me also very much. Well, this year you turned 16 in between the two weekends of the European Development Tour. Was the plan always to enter that second weekend as soon as you were old enough? Or did you think about maybe waiting until next year so you had a full season to go at? Yes, um, in, in the start of the year, I, I've seen that PDC have these two tournaments, one in August and one in November. And I just posted on Instagram in January that I will be making my debut in November and I did it, so it was like the plan from beginning that I play in November and not wait till next year. And I think you turned 16, I think around three weeks before this past weekend, the, the second development tour weekend, going to Niedenhausen. What were your hopes for the weekend? Were you going there just for the experience? Did you have any thought about getting that second spot? Um, <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, so I was expecting from me to get in the top 48 because it was first uh, said that top 48 will qualify for the youth uh, championship 
But at the time, PDC said that the top eight will qualify, uh, hoping that I have a great weekend and doing some great stuff. And yes, and as long the tournament goes, I won the first one for me, the fourth event. And I started to think about what's uh, possibly now to the top eight was just nearby me and but on the second spot of the ranking uh, wasn't even in my head at any time. Um, um, instead of the moment I realized that I'm in the second spot and, I, and no one can reach me. Well, I was looking back at your results from the weekend, your your second throw of your first match, you got 180, you won your first game 4-0, then you beat Justin Van Tegel 4-0 with a, a 98 average. Did you feel any nerves on your debut, those first few games, or did you feel settled in right away? Um, so the luck for me was that I knew my first um, my first um, play, uh, my first one who I played against, because I know him from tournaments here in Germany. It was a good game to uh, for the first game and then against Justin van der Gau, I don't know what happened there it was I think also my best average of the whole tournament and I don't know um, it's ju- just started so well and I was having fun at the moment and I played these two first legs and I just kept going on and I don't know what happened there but it was so good a uh, start for me and I just wanted to keep it on and did it against him. Well, you definitely kept it going. That first event on the Friday, you lost out in a, a close final to Rusty Jake Rodriguez, the, the runaway leader who finished top of the pole. Mike Van Dyvenbode had a 106 average to get you out in the, the second event. How did you reflect on that first day, your first two events on the development tour? Um, yes, so I was really, really, really happy with tournament number one. I also didn't expect that I get so far, and I was a little bit, yeah, not devastating but uh, this 45 in the final I didn't I, I missed it and Roby takes the break and I was like ah, if I made it I'm, I may have a better chance but, but it was still everything was fine and just better than I ever thought and then this game against Mike he uh, goes free up uh, to lead and I um, make it free free for the decider and then he plays left and darts with uh, his with, on, on his throw and I was I wasn't even sad about it because I know it was a great day, and uh, um, and I was just happy of the first tournament. And I also played well against him. I played average of ninety, I think, and this is not bad. And I know if I do this, not every one of the players can play a one hundred six average every time. And this was just the advice. The yeah, the advice for me that I can do it and I just have to keep on. Well, you definitely did that. It got even better on the, the Saturday. It took 110 average from Rusty to get you out in the semi-finals of that first event. Then you go back-to-back. You win the second event on the Saturday. You back it up by winning the first event on the Sunday. At what point are you starting to think that finishing second and qualifying for Ali Pali is a, a real possibility? Um, so on the semi-final of the first event on Sunday, my mom comes to me because Gabi was talking to her that if I am keep going on, I will have the second spot and a place for the Pelly. I didn't know that the second spot even have a place for the Alexandra Palace because I thought it was Rusty, but I don't know that he was already qualified for it. So I won this game against Thomas Schudek in the semi-finals. I also was free Neil. 3-0 down and got 5-3 for me and this final against Gavlas it wasn't the best game but I knew at that point there are only three players left that can reach me get in just needs on the field and Bialetsky they but they had one of them had to win and I was just hoping that I'm uh, that they don't do this because I also had in round one Mike Van Dovenbelo on my board and I was just hoping that they can't do it and I'm going through. Well you finish up in that second spot, you made the, the semi-finals on the last event but by then you'd already done enough to get to Ali Pali. When you find out that you had done enough, what was that moment like? Yes, I knew exactly. I was with my sponsor Max Weiland behind the game, Bialetsky being on the field and I reached the uh, quarter final and I Bialecki I know Bialecki couldn't couldn't go uh, hold on to me and I know if Bialecki wins this I go to Ali Pelli and then he has this 112 Mr. Matchdard on double 16 
Sonnefeld wasn't on the finish und Bialek and Bialecki checked with 16 to win it for one and I just I just hugged uh, Max and he started crying and I was just one moment away from it and then we were so happy then we go to my family to my friends who were, who were sitting on the table and they all uh, congratulated me and I just please stop it's not official yet and I think at the moment PDC posted this on her on her Instagram I I just can't believe it it's what, what a feeling it is it's just unbelievable for me a special moment and so early on in your darts career as well you're only 16 and I, I read somewhere you were back in school today is that right yes i was back in school today yes and are you at college at the moment are you what are you studying at the moment yes i have three more years in my school and then i may start to um be a teacher that's this is the plan um, Dart is in second place right now, but if it's keep, keep on like that, I think there is a career that can that can be made. Very nice. Well, what was it like walking into school this morning? Uh, uh, was everyone aware? Your, your classmates, were they aware of what you've done at the weekend, qualifying for the World Championship? What was their reaction? Yes, uh, they, I don't expect that most of them knew that they all congratulated me uh, in school, before school, on my way to school, <laughs> um, after school. Also, uh, every time they got to me and uh, said how proud they are. And also, a lot of them don't know what it means to be 16 and play a world championship. So they just like asking, oh, are you playing then against Michael van Gerven and stuff? And I was like, yes, they're playing there too. And they were like, wow, oh my God, amazing. And it was also a great day because of them all. Brilliant. Well, you also won £6,000 at the weekend too. What do you plan on, on spending that money on? Or is it going to go straight to funding the two trips that you're going to have here to England for the, the World Youth and then the, the World Championship? Yes, um, the plans for the the prize money I've got of PDC, I'm just, um, um, I'm not spending then, I'm just keep it for me and just spending on uh, hotels and tournament costs of other PDC tournament and just make like a little a bank condo, I don't know if this is English word, something like that we will do with the money and then spend it for other PDC events or the hotel or something. Well, a few more before we let you go. The, the draw for the World Championship, that's not going to be for another three weeks. But are you looking at the, the list of Pro Tour qualifiers that we've got? Is there anyone in particular that you'd like to play? Maybe a, a legend like a, a Raymond van Barneveld, anyone that you've got your eye on? Yes, um, how you mentioned Raymond is also my idol. I have, I'm just in my room right now and I see my wall with a picture of him. It would be... Uh, in Germany we say the cherry on the top if I play against him it would be so nice I just want to play someone who I know and I know he's uh, known by everybody and I'm just wonder it's it's such it's, it doesn't matter to me how I play or how the match is going I just want to enjoy this moment this stage in Alexandra Palace and it would be Really, really amazing if I had someone like Raymond in my first round. Well, fingers crossed for that. We're looking forward to the draw, and you're going to be the, the second youngest player to play at the PDC World Championship as, as a 16-year-old. But as you mentioned there, you, you've got plans to, to carry on with your school and to become a teacher, but the, the darts is something that could potentially get bigger for you. Are you planning to go to Q School next year? I know there's a lot of our listeners that will want to know if you're going to be heading there in the, the start of next year. Yes, um, I'm planning to go to Kyrgyzko next year, of course, and also play the challenge tour and the development tour and all stuff I can do uh, uh, on the PDC. I'll just have some, uh, do, um, become some experience and just keep on playing uh, such good standard. Excellent. Well, lastly, before we let you go, what is it you're most looking forward to about playing in the World Championship? Is it getting on that big stage at Ali Pali? Is it being part of the, the biggest tournament in darts or just testing yourself against one of the, the best? Or is it all of those? Yes, um, I think the best moment is the moment I'm on my walk and I'm on my stage where everyone 
on the TV or in the in the players are watching on me and focus on me. On and it really doesn't matter to me how it goes, how the game goes. If I lose uh, three no, or if I lose three two, it's just so doesn't matter to me. I just want to enjoy this moment, and I'm looking forward to go to Alexandra Palace, have to walk on, be on stage, and just play my darts. Well, it's going to be a great moment. We can't wait for it, Fabian. Really appreciate you taking out some time to have a chat with us so soon after what you did at the weekend. Congratulations again on qualifying for Ali Pallion, and all the best when it comes around next month. Thank you. Thanks again to Fabian for joining us. And Fabian Schmutzler, remember the name. The 16-year-old wins two events on his development tour debut weekend, finishes second to qualify for Ali Pali. Just how impressed were you with the young German at the weekend? <laughs> Words don't begin to describe how impressive he was in, well, his first taste of PDC action. Very first event makes the final, losing out to... Rusty Jake Rodriguez didn't play as well as he had earlier in the day, but still averaged almost 84. Next event did go out first match, but that's because the pigeon averaged 106 and a half against him. <laughs> still, he still nearly won that match, losing in a last leg decider. Next day, another semifinal loss. Didn't play well again, again against Rusty Jake Rodriguez, but Rusty Jake averaged 110 and a half. Even if he did, well, even if he did play well, probably wasn't going to win that match, but that just made him hungry. And he wins the title, wins another title, and then makes another semifinal where he finally goes out to someone who didn't average 110, 84 and change. Not bad on the development door in the semifinals after a long day. <laughs> what more can you say? It was just really impressive. And I think the consistency of his performances were, were the most important thing. Almost every match was somewhere between 80 and 90. He had a couple that he dripped a little lower, a couple where he got into the mid, low to mid 90s. But he was just really consistently playing at that 18 dart leg average. And yeah, that's not going to win a match at the Alexandria Palace in a few weeks if he plays at that level. But it'll... It'll nick some legs, might even nick a set here or there. And he's 16 years old. He's doing this in his first weekend, his first taste of this action. That is really, really impressive. He surely has a better game once he's playing more against the best players in the world. When we, if we see him next year on the Challenge Tour, or hell, maybe win a tour card and we'll see him on the Pro Tour. As he plays more of that, He'll only up his game from there as long as he stays dedicated and stays interested in progressing as a professional. But boy, this was an impressive debut, as impressive as it ever as ever could be. And I think it's most of all not the fact that he won two events and made at least the semifinals in five of the six. It's the consistency because no, almost no one has consistency like that. Almost no one is going to play at that same pretty darn good level every single match. For 35 matches. And he did. If he has that consistency going forward. And as his game continues to improve. We're going to be seeing a lot of him. And it won't be long. Before we're seeing a lot of him. Yeah. It was so impressive wasn't it. And I had the pleasure of chatting to him about an hour ago. When we were recording this. And you guys have just heard the interview with him. And you know. He's, I think he's still a, a little bit in shock. I was speaking to him. Probably about 24 hours or so. Since he got the spot at Ali Pali finished second on the development tour. So it's been a, a whirlwind three days, four days for him, making his debut on the development tour. And remember, he couldn't even play the first weekend because he wasn't 16. He was still 15. He didn't turn 16 until mid-October, around three weeks before this past weekend. And he said at the start of this year, he's going to miss the, the first one because he wasn't old enough, but he was going to enter the, the second development tour. He was going to give himself a, a shot. And he said to himself, he wasn't even thinking about Ali Pali. He wasn't thinking about finishing second or winning titles it really was just dip your toe in the water first crack at the development tour and what he's been able to do winning the two titles the other semi-finals that he's had what can you say about it and it has took some very big performances to, to knock him out of some of these events you mentioned them there the two defeats that he had to rusty jake rodriguez who ran away with the, the overall title but a, a 96 average in the, the final 110 average in one of the semi-finals and you mentioned that the 106 from Mike van Dijvenboda as well it, it could have been even better than than what it was but finished second he has got the spot at Ali Pali and he's only just turned 16 and there are there have been some players that we've spoken about on this show young players that have made a breakthrough we talk about Justin Van Tegel, who we saw back on the development tour this past weekend it was good to see him back playing but he was one of the first players that we spoke about on this show he won back-to-back 
BDO World Youth titles at Lakeside, and we all thought he was going to be the next big thing. Leighton Bennett as well. He's won a, a BDO World Youth title at Lakeside, and he's almost turning 16 and, and getting ready to play at Q School. So it is always exciting when we see these young players come out of nowhere. And I said it at the start of the development tour season, probably back in the, the players that are on tour to have a, a good couple of weekends, finish high up the rankings. But you are going to see some new players. You're going to see some new names that you've never heard of before. And, and Fabian Schmutzler is a name that maybe some of our German listeners will have known, but I don't think many of our listeners would have known his name before the weekend. So can't really say much more. It is what dreams are made of. What a way to announce yourself. And we will see him at Ali Pali. He's got school to still focus on he's uh he's got another couple of years at school he wants to be a, a teacher as well but what we've seen on his first weekend on the pdc a professional dart player is something that could be in his future as well and now we'll move on to our fourth guest of the weekend it's with the sky sports presenter emma payton i'm pleased to say i'm joined by the face of sky sports his darts coverage the presenter emma payton thanks for the time emma how you doing Well, it's great to have you on, and we're talking only a few days before the start of the Grand Slam, one of Sky's biggest events on the calendar. How is the prep going ahead of presenting for nine days in Wolverhampton? Yeah, good. Um, I'm really excited, actually. I've got a few days kind of away from, because uh, I've been back to Sky Sports News kind of in the interim after the World Grand Prix and uh, before the Grand Slam, so now I've got a few days off to kind of, like you say, get my prep going. Um and then head to Wolverhampton on Friday. First couple of days are going to be busy because obviously they're double sessions. Um, but yeah, I can't wait. Um, it's just, you, you see the draw as well. And then I'm, I, I feel like we probably say this every year on Sky as well, saying like, oh my God, the groups, like, you know, some really tough groups, incredible draw. But um, it, but they are tough groups and it is an incredible draw. Um, and I love the group stage as well, you know, just kind of short and sharp. We've got two incredible women there. I, I was literally at the gym earlier and I was saying to the guy I was training with, oh, I'm not going to be here next week, by the way, because I'm in Wolverhampton for darts. And the first question was, oh, what day is Fallon on? You know, and so I'm really looking forward to, to seeing Fallon and Lisa. And, of course, Barney's back on Sky as well. So um, you'll see some montages, no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 you've been presenting Sky's coverage of the darts for over a year now. Uh, starting out with the behind closed doors events. But now, of course, we're back to the, the full crowds. What has the whole experience been like for you so far? Yeah, um, God, it's actually weird when you say over a year because um, that has gone ridiculously just quick. Um, and I kind of like, yeah, it's just been, it's been unreal. Like, and the, the sort of highlight is the people that I work with. I mean, obviously, you, you, got, you two are people who are massively in starts and, you know, you, you know, I'm sure you know what it's like working with Wayne Marzo or you get, a, you get an idea of what it's like working with the likes of Wayne Marzo. But it's just been, it's a weird one because I kind of come away from every event saying, that was the best one. Um, and I, especially since fans came back. So I remember that last week of the Premier League, I think those last, last five days when we had, you know, like a limited amount of, of people in. I remember driving home thinking that is the best week of work I've, I've ever had. And then I went to the World Match Play and everyone had told me about the World Match Play and, and told me how incredible it was going to be, how unreal the venue was, um, how, you know, the fans were darts fans who were going to be there. And then, again, I remember driving home from Blackpool thinking, OK, that is the best nine days I've ever had. And then, you know, even at the World Grand Prix, it happened again because it's just, it's almost like now that we're kind of getting fans properly back and things back to how it should be and darts back, you know, as a, as a product back to what it should be. Um, yeah, I kind of, it's a weird one because I kind of think, what's my best moment so far? Like, I, every time we do something, it's just tops again. Um, so no doubt I'll say something similar after the Grand Slam and, definitely off the world for sure good times well we'll come back to the darts in a moment but as a budding journalist myself yeah. i'm always keen when we get a guest on from the media to find out about their journey how they've got to where they are now yeah. so talk us through your career so far where did it all begin yeah um it's a funny one actually because i've actually been at sky for nine years now and sometimes i say that to people they're like what really wow well, i thought like you know i've only sort of seen you around the last couple of years but it was just a journey that um took a while to, I basically, don't want to bore you at all, so tell me if I'm boring you. <laughs> um, so basically, um, I, did a, I did a degree in, in sports science at Loughborough and wasn't really sure kind of what I wanted to do. Kind of got towards the end of that course and then, and, and I was really into athletics at the time, so I was training. 
obviously that failed. Um, but yeah, so um, I kind of got towards the end of my course, and then one of my friends did some work experience at a. Uh, I can't remember, and it was at a newspaper on a sports desk, basically. And um, she really hated it, haven't had a really awful experience. Um, but it kind of sparked a, a, sort of a thought and train of thought in, for me. And I thought, you know what, if I'm not going to make it in athletics, even if I am, it's good to, I want to have something else that I'm going to do. Um, how about I think about reporting or think about, um, you know, writing or um, presenting sport. So I then did a master's basically in sports journalism just to kind of cross that divide because I'd done sports science which was not related to any of this um, and ended up doing a master's and at the end of that course I basically just applied for a job at Sky Sports and I feel like again that is something that people think people get jobs by people they know or you know through someone and this was I applied for a job on their digital team so it was basically writing for SkySports.com and for the Sky Sports app and got that job. I was with that team for a year. I then moved into the production, worked on a breakfast production team, which meant being at my desk for 3 a.m. four days a week, um, which is just horrific when I think back to it. Um, but I did that for about six years. I was, I was on a production team. Started at the bottom. I started, if you watch Sky Sports News, you know the, the kind of graphics around the screen basically compiling that, so writing out like a Premier League table, obviously some of this is automated now, um, writing out some of the lines on the bottom of the screen, um, and then kind of like working my way up in production, but I always wanted to present, like that was the goal. So I was coming in, sitting at my desk at three in the morning, and you'd see the presenters walk in a few hours later, and you'd, you'd basically be writing the scripts for them, and I just thought, ah, oh. like, you know, it's such a, I'm sure you guys, like you say, being in the industry, it's just, it's just not easy. Um, and I think, I thought sort of getting a job at Sky and, and being in there, you know, I'd be on TV next week, but it just didn't really work out like that. And, and it took a lot of time. And in the end, I I sort of just would email people. I'd knock on doors and just try and get any opportunities I could, whether that was, you know, presenting, reporting, um, doing kind of like Facebook lives with Gary Neville if he came into the Sky Sports News studio or things like that. Um, and sort of opportunities came about and, you know, you had to grab things when they did. And then it was really like an actual on-screen role was advertised as a presenter and reporter at Sky Sports News and in the end I actually got that job which was lucky because those kind of jobs don't really get advertised a lot so um, yeah it's been a long journey and, and now I'm presenting darts um, which is the job so um, yeah it, it's taken a while but I've kind of got the I suppose where I want to be but it, it, I feel like you're never happy with where you are right I mean the darts I'm very happy with that but you know when you just it's Everyone thinks like, oh, you've made it now, you've done this, but it's always, you're always kind of, have you ever really made it? I don't know. Well, you've you've got to the presenting stage of things, which is obviously a goal that you had, and you are presenting the yeah. the coverage of the darts for Sky and since the, the summer of last year when Dave Clark stepped down from presenting the role after a, a long time. How did it come about you presenting after he left? Were you pushed forward by Sky for the role, or did you reach out and say that you were interested in having a go? Yeah, no, it was really... Um thanks to the producer, Rory, really, who's just an OG, basically. He's been producing darts for, um, well, about, about 30 years. So any kind of evolution, innovation you've seen on darts coverage over that time, he's basically been down to him. Um, and it's kind of just a mad story about opportunity, really, having someone who kind of believed in me. Um, yes, luck and timing as well. Um, I, I mentioned those kind of um, opportunities I've been trying to get out sort of just while I could when I was in production. Um, so about three years ago, actually, um, I worked on an eSports event for Sky, and it was I, I wasn't a reporter at the time, but I just kind of hustled for it. And um, Rory was produced, doing a day's, day's producing on this event, and we didn't even speak. We literally, he didn't even remember me. He told me that since. But um, we, um, we, we barely even said a few words to each other. But I was then, uh, about a year later, I was presenting on Sky Sports News when I was actually in my presenter role. And I, and I got an email from Rory, just out of the blue. And bearing in mind, you don't get a lot of feedback from people. So, you, you know, you only, I feel like in these kind of jobs, you only really hear when, when something maybe goes wrong. So I had an email from Rory basically saying he'd randomly put Sky Sports News on and, um, you know, thought I was brilliant. And I thought, oh, this is really random. I don't really know him, but that's, that's really kind. And then, again, about a year later, I mean, you, you, Dave Clark was, was leaving Sky. He, he, well, he, he'd announced that he was retiring from the darts, darts job and Rory sent me a message saying, you know, are you into darts by any chance? And it kind of just went from there. Obviously, I went and I did a, a few sort of days report 
supporting, loved it, and yeah, um, here I am now, about to go to the Grand Slam, and then the world is around the corner. So yeah, um, just very lucky, really. <laughs> Um, what about the darts then? We know you obviously got a, a, a sport background. Were you interested in darts before then? Were you listening to our show right from the beginning, or is that something that you've uh, immersed <laughs> you know yourself what? in? I've listened well? to your show from day one. Okay, <laughs> um, it was it, it's funny because I think back now and I think you know it was something that would be on in my house as a kid. Um, and more recently, I mean, my partner, you know, is, is quite into darts, but he watches it a lot. So I had it around me, you know, like been to the world a number of times. Um, I always remember as well, I mentioned to you about being at Loughborough and, and doing sports science, having full-on arguments with people on my course about whether darts was a sport or not. Um, yeah. But um, it's, it's funny because I, I, I think when I, when I say to you about my dream of kind of being on screen, I, I still didn't think working on it was possible. Um, and where I said I'd worked at Sky Sports News for nine years, you know, nearly seven of that was behind the scenes. I think my, I always thought, well, my path was to try and get on Sky Sports News and look, that was hard enough. Um, I didn't really think anything else was realistic. And I, yeah, like I said, I think I got a bit lucky there and, and had someone who had a bit of faith in me. But, but yeah, I've always been into darts, but obviously more so now the fact that I'm involved in it and, and I know a lot of people in it as well. So, uh, yeah, crazy time. Well, let's touch on your presenting role. We see the, the final product on our screens, but obviously a lot of work goes into the broadcast before then with all the, the prep. So on a typical week, we're heading into the Grand Slam. How much research prep goes into an event like that? Yeah, like, I spend a lot of my time as well watching back, so, um, like, even speaking to you now, just earlier I was watching the 2012 final with um, Barney and MVG, uh, baby MVG, um, so it kind of spends quite a lot of time watching stuff back, um, we have a kind of partnership with the guys at Dark Oracle, so that they send a lot of stats through, um, and just kind of like, say something like this, where you've got 32 players, um, just kind of coming through each player, and um, yeah, reams and reams of notes. I'm someone who is like overly ridiculous with the prep, basically. Um, but even just just to, to kind of give you guys an insight into what we do on the day as well in terms of prep. Um, obviously, the weekend's a little bit harder because we've got two shows, but we we would probably typically get to the kind of venue a few hours before and rehearse, and we do a couple of things with Sky Sports News as well so that they can promo it. Um, but yeah, I mean... Um, I, I, like I said, I like to be overly prepared and I'm not someone who will just kind of turn up <laughs> and just wing it. Um, but yeah, note taking, watching things back. Um, obviously a lot of the prep is, you know, watching things, the, the tournament. So watching players championship, obviously being at the last, uh, being at the, the World Grand Prix and watching the World Series of darts final, things like that. So, um, it's not exactly hard prep when, when a lot of it is watching darts. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Well, you touched on your, your work with the, the Sky team and, and Wayne Mardle, who we should give a mention to you, to have built up a, a great rapport on stage. We, we can see that. So what's it been like working with Wayne, Mark Webster, all of those players? Um, any stories you can share with us? Oh, so good. Like, um, all of the guys. and cause A lot of people, I think, um, I know a lot of people are always kind of asking what it's like taking over from Dave Clark. And one of the big things as well that, I suppose people don't think about because they look like you say they look at the end product on the screen but there, there was a pressure as well when you've got the, the team behind the scenes and you know you took Dave away from that you took Rod away from it for a bit because he wasn't well and um, they've got such a family kind of vibe um, but that's it's kind of been the best part you know like I'm a little bit obsessed with Wayne <laughs> people always say to me what's it like working with Wayne and I'm like oh my gosh he's incredible I love him um, so the, the rapport isn't a lie um, he's just you know, you, you see it yourself, don't you? He's, in terms of kind of the, the job side of things, he's just so insightful, so engaging. Um, he can see things that I just don't think anyone else can see. Um, but off screen, he's the same. But like, you know, he's he's that kind of person that walks into a room and you, you're, you know, he just exudes this kind of energy. Um, and it's even little things like, um, because he's just been such a sport to me, but he'll, it's a little thing that he'll say things before a show, like when the director's counting down by four, three, two, one to go on air, you know, it's things like he'll say, right, let's do this, guys, let's have a great show. And, you know, sometimes I find myself now, I go back to Guy Sports News and I'm sitting in a studio on my own, um, and the director and the producer are in the gallery, and I'm going, right, come on, let's do this, guys, let's have a great show. And they're like, what, going <laughs> <Hang> on. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, and he's a leader, right? Like, he just, I don't know, there's something about him, like, um, this is a bit cringe, actually, so hopefully he's not listening, but um, I, I was listening 
listening to a story the other day um, that, that Podrick Harrington was speaking on a podcast and he was speaking about when he captained the, the, the Europe Ryder Cup team and he was saying that he, he met up with Charles Ferguson for um, basically for some, um, well, help, you know, advice tactics. And he was asking uh, Sir Alex what he would do in certain situations. You know, when I'm giving a team talk, how do I do this? What should I say here? And every time, Fergie would say, well, what do you think? And he would say what he thought, and Fergie would be like, that's a really good idea, it's a really good idea, but maybe add this as well. And that is, like, when I think about Wayne going into work, that is, he empowers you, basically. Because I, I, that was one of the most nerve-wracking things, like I said, meeting these guys and, you know, working with them when they've had the team with Clarkie for such a long time. Um, but he's properly, like, a leader like that, and, like, kind of empowered me to be like, yeah, okay, yeah, we've, we've got this. Um, and, I mean, in terms of story, but all the guys are so supportive. Like, Webby is, um, his, his memory's ridiculous, by the way. Like, I've never met anyone with a memory like his. Um, Pikey will message me probably on a weekly basis, like, how are you? How's it going? Um, and obviously, it's brilliant having Rod back because I hadn't met him, you know, at all, which is strange when he was such a big part of this team. Um, like, stories are funny because... Even, like, the, the Wayne losing his voice one is just, like, a yeah. classic. Because yeah. um, I remember being like, what has just happened? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then it was like, he's not coming back the next night. And I thought, oh, no, this is not good. Um, but, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know. They're, honestly, it's, it's such a great group to work with. And I kind of, I only realise it when I step away. And I'm like, it, it's a brilliant culture, is, I suppose the right word. But just, like, really family kind of... Uh, quite a close-knit group actually you know um so they've been they've been so just supportive yeah good to hear well there's lots to look forward to even after the grand slam the, the world championship five weeks away it's yeah. going to be your first presenting in front of a full alley pally crowd to touch wood <laughs> and then next year that the premier league we're going to be back with all the large venues yeah. you must be excited about what's coming up oh i'm so excited i was just looking at the um the premier league uh, schedule earlier um, and yeah, I just can't wait because I just haven't experienced that before. I mean, the Milton Keynes, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same, Alex. I'm not going to lie. Um, so yeah, I can't wait. Um, can't wait for Ali Pally either. It's just weird thinking once the Grand Slam's done, you know, a, a couple of weeks after that and then, then we'll be into it. So, um, of course, we've got the draw before that as well. So yeah, um, can't wait. Can't wait. Well, we've got some listener questions to, to get to you uh, before we let you go. And the first one comes from Andrew Kinsman, who says, Emery's uh, doing an amazing job as Sky Sports presenter, filling in some very big shoes. But what's the strangest assignment you've been given in all your time at Sky Sports? Oh, gosh. Gosh, OK, strangest. Did you not see um, me taking Callum Ritz, by the way, to an arcade yes, at, yes. Uh, at the World Match Play? Because that was pretty strange. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, strangest. I mean, that was quite fun. It wasn't so much strange, but um, nothing sort of, nothing crazy, I don't think. Like, um, not all the glamour jobs, you know. Um, but yeah, we'll go with Cannon Ridge just because I can't really think of anything else on the top of my head. Shout out to Cannon Ridge. Next one comes from Kevin Fitzpatrick, and you touched a little bit on it earlier, but he said that he's a runner or he tries to run, but he read somewhere that Emma reached a, a high level as a runner when younger. Is this true, and how good was she? Um... Well, high level, don't know about that. Um, I did take it fairly seriously, though. I, I topped 10 in my age group when I was under 23, so um, I kind of mentioned earlier I went to Loughborough, and yeah, like, I, I had big dreams. That was, you know, I, I genuinely wanted to be, um, well, I want, I want to represent Great Britain. That was my aim. Yeah, I wanted to go to an Olympic, I was 400 metre runner, so not a shame to say, Kev, that I fell short, um, basically. Injuries happened. Um, obviously, I got got a job at Sky and was working. So just the shift work I mentioned before, working on an early team, and it was, you know, just crazy hours. Um, my coach passed away as well in 2014, so I kind of feel like that was just all the beginning of the end. But um, yeah, like a decent level, you know, um, national level would would be in national finals. Um, and I still train now, but just completely different. I mean, for life now, you know, for kind of mental health if anything. But um, taught me a lot training, trying to haul myself around an athletic track. And when you don't want to, when you don't want to do it, and when your legs are like no. Um, but yeah, to an all right level. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good level in our books. Well, the next one comes from a, a player, Matthew Edgar, who says, "Do you enjoy Edgar TV?" <laughs> do you know what? I saw that one. I saw that question. Um, and I was like, I'm not going to lie, okay, I haven't seen Edgar TV. I knew it was a thing, so we're kind of halfway there. 
Um, but yeah, I need to get on YouTube and start watching that. So um, let's plug the show, but I will start watching it, yeah. <laughs> well, you've got a chance to, to make up to, to Matthew now. The next question comes from Taylor McLaughlin, who says, who is your favourite player? Oh, oh, OK, right, yeah, it's Maker, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to have a favourite. Come on, like, I can't have a favourite. I, I have to sit on the fence like John Park, come on. Um, <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's kind of like you, where you, you interview people week in, week out, right? So I'm sure you you almost you become, not, I'm not saying you change your mind, but the more you speak to people and realise um, how lovely people are and, you know, you get on with people and they... they you kind of like the players based on that, if that makes sense. Um, so, obviously, I see a lot of players around the hotels and stuff. So, look, I, I can't pick one out. That wouldn't be fair, OK? Fair enough. Well, two more from me before I let you go. And uh, I've been seeing that yeah. you've been doing some, some talks at, at colleges and schools recently for, for journalism students. Uh, what's uh, one piece of advice that you give them or that you would give to someone listening that wants to get into journalism? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, this is further down the line, but yourself is probably the biggest one because and it kind of ties into you know you, you, you spoke earlier about me kind of taking over from Dave Clark in a way and you know just just having the confidence to be yourself is such a it's a hard thing right because people say all the time oh just be yourself like just, just go out there and do that and it's like well that's quite hard you know <laughs> not easy um, so I kind of say uh, be yourself be really as authentic as you can um, because you're much more relatable uh, and believable, I suppose. So um, I suppose before that, before you get to that point, just perseverance. You just have to keep going. Like I said that story about um, taking, you know, um, ultimately nine years to get to this point where I am now in terms of being at Sky. Um, and it just took a while, but you have to kind of be resilient and keep going, keep knocking on those doors, keep sending those emails and maybe one day a door will open and you just need to kind of be ready for the opportunity. So a couple of pieces there. Some good advice. And, and last one, probably the most important one. Um, I believe you're a, a Manchester United fan. I'm also a United fan, Colchester United that uh, is, but are you Ollie in or Ollie out? Oh, tough. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, the, 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 what's it called? That, that road has been run, you know? That, 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 <laughs> is that the right phrase? Uh, I, I don't want to say I'm Ollie out, but yeah, I'm probably Ollie out. So yeah, let's get someone else in. And um, that squad of players that are there at the moment, I don't know how they can fail when you've got the likes of Ronaldo, Varan, who's a World Cup winner, you brought Sancho in finally uh, after chasing him for a couple of years. Um, so I'm a little bit confused as to, to how it's not working out at the moment, but... Um, yeah, I'm sad to say, Ollie out. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite jealous of that squad, and, and what a way to end it. Well, Emma, thank you very much for, for taking the time out to have a chat with us. We do appreciate it, especially on a, a busy week as it's going to be for you, and all the best for Wolverhampton and, and Ali Pally when it comes around as well. Thank you so much. So lovely to chat to you guys. Thank you. Thanks to Emma for joining us this week. Now we'll finish up with a couple of listener questions. We'll do these a uh, bit rapid fire. The first one coming from the darts referee who has who says, I have a discussion question for you guys. Should there be some sort of prerequisite to enter Q school standard-wise? Quite a few people seem to get very upset over lower averages at Q school every year. I think we have that now, really, didn't we, with the two stages that we had at Q school this year. And I know a lot of it was down to the virus, the restrictions, the PDC had to make sure there wasn't loads of people in the venue like they usually would the, the 300 400 500 people that you get at q school every year they had to limit it in some way and make it only a, a couple of hundred in the building at, at one time and i think this is probably what we're going to see next year i think we are going to see the the two stages stay and that is kind of your, your screening process isn't it your prerequisite if you want to be a, a tour card holder at a q school you do go through that first stage and the, the second stage the the buys for players that have just dropped off the tour the top performers from the, the challenge tour and the development tour so I guess really your, your high quality players the players that you'd be more likely to see get the tour cards they're already through to that second stage your, your players that vary in ability they are starting in the first stage so don't forget you've got another screening process before then you've got the what is it 500 pounds something like that to enter Q school plus your, your hotel your, your travel your, your food and drink it is a very very costly thing to do to enter Q school so that is probably the first thing that's going to put some people off entering then you've got to get to the the first stage then you've got to get through to the second stage so for me i I think we have got to that point now where we do have a a stage where the 
the lesser players, if you like, and they could all still beat me anyway. But they go through to the, the first stage. And then if they can get through that, then you've got the cracker getting the, the tour cards. That is when the, the tour cards come into play. So for me, I, I think we are at that point now. I think we have got that prerequisite. You have got to get through to that first stage to play for a tour card. Yeah, and as, assuming they bring that system back next year, or saying next year, it's just a couple months away. But assuming we keep on with having the two stages, I think that's the way to go. And it's not an idea that had crossed my mind a year ago before it got announced, but it was a really great idea. And from the start, it seemed like it was a good idea. And it at very least seemed like it was a necessary idea due to the social distancing requirements that you would need and couldn't do if you had 400 people um, in Q school. So it was built out of necessity, but it really worked well. And it really helped uh, fix some of the uh, problems of having just having everyone in one place from the beginning and some of those people not being up to par and not being up to scratch going forward if that continues i think that works and yes there will still be players who are weaker yes there will still be players who might not get out of the first stage just based on the luck of the draw but most of the people who were eliminated at the first stage if not everyone who was eliminated at the first stage had no chance to win a tour card or had no realistic chance to win a tour card that made it a lot fairer. There were a few people who slipped through, especially in the European one to the second round, who didn't have a legitimate chance to win a tour card, but there weren't many. Most of them, at least, you know, if they played well and they had their day, could have. And that type of qualification system and that type of barrier works. I don't think you need to tell someone they need to be able to play at a certain standard to even enter to begin with because of now having those two stages. So I'm with you, Alex. I think that the new the system that was introduced this year solved a lot of the worst problems that came from having some players who just weren't up to scratch playing against some of the players who might be former world champions. Um, I don't think there needs to be any further uh, restrictions added. Got to keep that dream alive and maybe one day me. Burton or Matthew Keane and the Dighton Nerd at Lenta Q School. That'll be some good content for you guys. Last question for you comes from John Thompson, who says, best player not qualified for the Worlds as of right now? That's a that's a tough question, um, but it has a very easy answer. Mark Walsh, who else? <laughs> Possibly. Maybe Costampi. Alex, do you agree with that one? Well, we know Mark Walsh is going to qualify this weekend. He's entered the, the World Seniors qualifiers. Yep, but, but as of the time of recording, he's not yet qualified, but I guess I'll guess I'll pick another answer for that reason, because if you don't listen to this show by Friday, it'll already be dated by then. Ooh, I mean, there's so many really good players like you go back a few months. It did not look like possible that Andy Bolton would miss out those standards he's playing at the beginning of the year. But he ended up missing out. Boris Kersmar has had a great season, played really well this year, didn't qualify. And you have players who struggled this year, like uh, Jeff Redis Van, who couldn't get results, but we know how good he is. He made the semifinals of the World Bass play not that long ago. But who's the best who didn't qualify? Ah, ooh, that's such a tough question. It is such a tough question. Can I just say I don't know? <laughs> of course you can. I'm going to say I don't know because there's so many good players, really good players, who didn't qualify. Yeah, so I'll leave it at I don't know because it's hard to pick the best. Yeah, it is really hard to pick. And if you're going just based on pure talent alone, the, the highest ranked player, Jeffrey Desvan, not in the field, although he's not been in good form this year. If you're looking on the averages, though, the, the players' championship averages for the year, James Wilson, 94.37 for the season, which is 30th on that list. You look back at the, the fifth Super Series, he looked like he was building some momentum. He's a player that is in real danger now of, of losing his tour card, but he had a 108 average that week. He had back-to-back last 32s. Then he lost seven consecutive first-round games in players' championships, and that really did set him back. So based on the averages, you'd, you'd put him up there. Andy Bolton, you mentioned, go back to the start of the year. He was in with a real shout of, of getting to the world match play. He lost a, a close semi-final at the start of the year to Dirk van Dijvenbode. If he wins that, he's probably going to be in the world championship, isn't he? So he'll, he'll probably be up there. I'm probably going to go with... John Henderson, a TV winner this year. He did win the World Cup alongside Peter Wright a few months ago. I think when he is on form, he is a a top 32 player. And I think we thought he would get into the World Championship after that World Cup win. That would give him the belief and and confidence to go and do it on the floor. But he's going to be one that is going to be at the PDPA qualifiers. So I'm going to go with with Hendo for that one. There's some memory remembering back to 
semifinals of Pro Tour events back in uh, April. Uh, but anything else for this week? Well, you've got to get your research in before we start, of course. But I've got to say, big thank you to our guests for joining us. What, what a lineup we had this week. Thanks to Nathan Rafferty, Mike Decker, Fabian Schmutzler. Congratulations again on what a weekend he's had. Emma Payton as well for joining us. Thanks to everyone for listening as well. And a shout out to two of our listeners, Tom Park and John Thompson, who they were the ones that got your trivia question last week. The six players that have had that similar records to Johnny Clayton in uh, beating Michael Van Gogh in a certain amount of times. I can't remember what it quite was, but congratulations to those guys who got the answers. I'm going to set the trivia question this week, and it is based on one of our guests on the show this week, and it is that Fabian Schmutzler has qualified for the PDC World Championship. His first after finishing second on the European Development Tour is going to be 16 years old when he takes to the Ali Pali stage, the second youngest to play in the tournament's history. But what I want to know is, who is the youngest player to play in the tournament? Tweet us your answer. First one to get it. We'll get a shout out on the show next week. I think I know that one, but I'll I'll let everyone else uh, give it a go. But thanks uh, to all four of our guests this week. Thanks to uh, everyone who is uh, listening, who's sending us questions, who's answering our trivia questions, who's somehow figuring out the answer to my trivia questions last week. (laughs) I did not know that one offhand one last week. I had to look it up to create the question if anyone knew it offhand well done but we'll be back i don't know if we'll have a show next week because we have the uh grand slam going on all week Uh, maybe we'll try to get an episode in tuesday after the group stage is done but we'll play it by ear and if we're not back next week we'll certainly be back the week after that to recap the third to last event on the pdc calendar for the year and to start looking ahead to the players championship finals which returns to minehead in just a few weeks time. Um, Until then, hang tight. World Championships is just around the corner.